May the mind of Christ, my Savior, live in me from day to day. I truly hope that is the aim of each and every one of us. This evening, um, the, the sermon title is Thinking Biblically About Voting Issues. Um, it's not a subject that I necessarily want to speak to, but I do feel like in, in times such as ours, it is necessary for us to make sure that we are thinking biblically. Tuesday is the election, and then thankfully this election season will be behind us once again. And we have a lot of important issues on the ballot this election. Uh, no matter what happens, it will be a very consequential election. A lot of things could change for our community and our state as a result of what happens on Tuesday. Uh, we as Americans do have a, a great privilege of having a say in how our country and how our state and how our local community is governed. And so it's a very important responsibility that we have. It's a gift that we've been given, an opportunity to vote in an election. And it's really important that we think clearly as we take such a responsibility on. What we do with our vote is not a meaningless issue. It's not an unimportant issue. And this evening, I would like us to think about how we use our vote, not only in this election, but how we think about voting in general and in future elections. Now, I know some of you have already voted, as, as more people have voted early this election than others, and that's fine. And I still want to talk about how we should think about voting. I don't know if you've noticed, but elections these days have changed a lot. Change, they've changed a lot from what they've been in even the recent past. It used to be we would vote on issues like how our tax dollars are spent or, or different things like that. But more and more, voting has become a moral issue. More and more, we are voting on moral issues. Morality is showing up on the ballot very clearly, and we'll see that as we speak of a few of the things we'll be voting on here this evening. And typically, we don't like to preach politics. That's not our purpose. We are not here to, to uh, politic for a certain candidate, to, to endorse one candidate or another, and that's not what I intend to do this evening. In fact, it's become more and more popular for the church in general to think that we need to stay out of politics. That politics is not the domain of the church, so we should just keep quiet about it. And honestly, as a nonprofit organization, we are prohibited from endorsing officially any certain candidate, and we don't plan to do that, and I don't plan to do that this evening. But the reality is, is that voting is a very important issue in our lives. Voting is a part of our, our life. And if we believe the Bible is sufficient for all of our life, then the Bible has something to say about how we vote. And so we need to think biblically about voting. And this, this idea of the church not speaking to politics and, and that the church should be silent on these issues is not a new problem, not a new idea. In fact, the, the great Charles Spurgeon had to, to deal with these things. I've seen it shared a few times, and in fact, Pastor Pyatt even sent it to me before this evening, knowing that I would be preaching on this. But this is what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, I often hear it said, do not bring religion into politics. But this is precisely where it ought to be brought. We ought to bring our biblical thinking into our everyday life. And, and voting is part of that. And I couldn't agree more with what he had to say there. So the Bible does have something to say about how we vote. So that's what we want, we want to look at this evening, a biblical approach to voting. And specifically, I want to think about two of the issues, really the amendments that will be on our ballots here in Florida. And these are not just political issues. This is not just a political decision. These are moral issues. These are issues that have to do with good and evil. In fact, a lot of the things we vote on, including the, the candidates we vote on, are moral issues. And so, yes, we do have the ability and the duty to speak to the moral issues of our day. We need to be clear on morality. 
what the Bible says about what is good and what is evil, what is right and what is wrong. So to be clear, I'm not going to be stumping for any political candidates tonight. That's not my intention. But we do need to speak to the morality of these issues. I saw a very well-known pastor, a guy who's written many books, and just recently in the last couple of weeks, he, he said or he, he put something on his social media, and he's, he said this, he said he's sharing his political opinion, and his political opinion is, never Trump, this year Harris, always Jesus. And I just, I want you to understand that is one of the most foolish things I've ever heard a pastor say. And I'm not a political commentator. I mean, I'm a preacher of the Bible. But the Bible has something to say about this. And what used to be considered just politics is more theological than it's ever been. Another pastor who I highly respect helped me by sharing his thoughts, helped me to formulate some of my own thoughts on this. So before we move to the specific issues, I do want to just share some thoughts on how we should think about the candidates we will be voting on. And again, I'm not endorsing any individual person, but we need to think about some of the, the platforms that are out there on our ballots. So here's five thoughts about voting for these platforms. And number one, and I do want to make sure that this is clear, that we are thinking clearly on this. The Democratic Party, their platform, it is a, really a demonic death cult under the power of Satan. And you can see that by the things that they put for, in the forefront. And I'm not trying to pit one side against another tonight. But to vote for the Democrats is to vote for a party that's built their platform on everything God hates. From the mutilation of bodies, to the murder of babies in the womb, to the sexualization of children. That's what they have at the forefront. So again, this is not your preferred candidate over the other. These are moral issues. And the other side isn't necessarily all that much better but there's one side who is incredibly wicked in the platform that they represent. It is their calling card. It's what they want to do. They don't hide it. They have abortion facilities outside of the Democratic National Convention. It is the most radical party in our country's history. So honestly, I don't see how you could be a Christian and support that platform, the things they stand for. Now, I understand there are different political opinions among Christians, and there are those who vote for different candidates for different reasons. And I don't think that those are good reasons, but very, at the very least, bottom line, the political platform itself cannot be supported by a Christian. We do need to be clear on these things. This is wickedness at the forefront. And in Romans chapter 1, as it lists out the, the heinous sins represented by the, the depravity of man, as it comes to the end of the chapter, Paul condemns not only those who are practice, practicing those sins, but he says in Romans 1.32, although they know the righteous requirement of God, those that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they give hearty approval to those who practice them. So, the, the sins of human depravity seen in Romans 1, it's not just those who practice them who are condemned, it's those who give a, approval to them. So we do need to be careful on what we are giving approval to. That's the first thing. Secondly, we have a responsibility and a privilege to vote for the option that best stems the tide of evil. I know with the options that we are presented, 
The temptation is strong just to forego voting altogether, to not even bother with it, to not even make a choice because it doesn't seem like there's a very good choice. I get that. I totally understand that. And I understand that, again, both of these candidates are broken people with many flaws. But one of them represents a better option at the preservation of life and upholding the family than the other does. And when it comes to our responsibility to vote, we should view voting as a stewardship issue. It's like the parable of the talents that Jesus told to his disciples. And the, the man who was given a talent that he didn't use, that he buried it, and when the uh, king came back to see how his servants used the talents given them, the man who wasted it and did nothing with it, he was called wicked and slothful. So the opportunities we're given, we need to steward well. Because we will be held to account by how we've been using the opportunities we have. Also, a failure to vote is a failure to express our gratitude for those who gave their life for our very right to do such a thing. And as Christians, we are called to uphold righteousness. Not only in our own life, but as much as we can in our land, in our community. So a failure to have any say in it when we have a say is a failure to obey the calling to try and uphold righteousness in our land. When it comes to our setting of government, the, the, the type of government that we have, we have a different setting than a lot of people in history. A lot of Christians in the past would really wish to be in the situation we are, that they could have a say in who rules over them. And the reality is we're given two options every four years to decide which direction we want our country to go in. And the reality is you don't have to like their personalities. Because honestly, I don't. But our options are to vote for the best policies to guide and direct our land. Again, neither candidate is perfect. That is quite obvious. But one of them is a far less terrible option than the other. That is also quite obvious. In fact, the word vote comes from the, the Latin word votum, which is to make a choice. And that's what we're given. And again, you're not voting for a pastor. You're voting for a person that would best uphold righteousness in our land. If we were voting for a pastor, none of them would get my vote. But that's not the reality. We need to not be distracted by the personalities they throw in our face on political ads and, and news programs and the things that they want to grab your attention with. You need to evaluate the reality of the choice that you have before you. So the third thing is, and these are even more important as we go, as these kind of thoughts proceed about the candidates we're voting for, they get more and more important. And thirdly, more importantly than the first two things I've said, our hope is not in a political party. Our hope is not in politics. Whoever's in the White House is far less important than who's on the throne. And Christianity spreads the fastest and the farthest in nations that are persecuted the most. So no matter what happens, it's good news. The reason our world is crumbling is because we are under the judgment of God. Because we've rejected God as a nation, as a world. And if you want to see political reform, if you want to see our country turn around, First, you need to have spiritual revival. Our country is not going to turn around because of who you vote for. Voting is incredibly important, and who you vote for is important. But the person in the White House is not the one that's going to save anybody. Politics is not our hope. Number four, and again, even more importantly, 
we should speak out against the evil of our day. We are called to do that. We are called to not remain silent to the wickedness around us. But you should never turn your mission field into your enemy. You can call out the policies. You can call out the issues. I can speak against the evil of abortion, which we will a little later on. You can speak about the things that make God weep, the trans agenda, homosexuality, the destruction of the home, whatever it may be. But I'm telling you the truth, I have a heart for those people. I don't hate those people. Those people need Christ. You ought to have a heart for those people too. Because you can get riled up online and you can live in your little insulated bubble fed by opinions that you like and you can point the finger and say it's them, them, them and it's all their fault. No. They are why you are here. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand our mission as Christians. We are to reach the lost, not blame the lost. So, don't turn your mission field into your enemy. And fifthly, and again, even more importantly, if you are more likely to promote your political views than you are to proclaim Jesus Christ, if you're more known for being a Republican or a Democrat than being a Christ follower, then your priorities are way out of whack. So I want you to understand those truths. You should go vote. It's important. We have been given this opportunity to steward. And honestly, it's not really a difficult decision. And I also want you to know that our hope is not in who's in office. Yes, there's ditches on both sides. And there's some ridiculous thinking in the world of politics even in the Christian world of politics. You see bumper stickers that say, Jesus 2024. I don't really know what that means. Jesus has been on the throne for 6,000 plus years, whenever time began. And he will be on the throne for another 10 billion trillion years. Jesus is undefeated. He is the king. So I don't really know what Jesus 2024 means. And you have people that are putting all of their hope in what happens on Tuesday. And don't get me wrong, it's important. It's consequential. But hear this clearly. Fellowship Baptist Church is going to go on no matter what happens in our election. Because the church is going to go on. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We are not on defense We're on offense. The battle's been won. Again, we don't have a perfect candidate to vote for, and if we were voting for a pastor, none of them would get my vote. But we're voting for the platform that we think will best stem the tide of evil in our nation. And we shouldn't be looking just at the personalities, because we can find flaws on both sides. We should vote, and we should steward that privilege that God has given us. And what I want to focus the rest of our time on is two of the things that we will be voting on in the Florida election, two of the amendments that are on our ballot. We have several other amendments on the ballot, but these two are specifically moral issues that we need to be clear on. We need to think clearly on. We do have voter guides out in the the foyer that are helpful and they give you some information that can help you uh, think about the the things that will be on the ballot and and those things again are are helpful but the two amendments that I want to think about tonight are Amendment 3 and Amendment 4. Amendment 3 and Amendment 4. Again the other amendments are important too and you, you should read up and make sure you're informed on what those things are but Amendment 3 and Amendment 4 are specifically moral issues. 
Amendment 3 is about the legalization of recreational marijuana. That's what one of the things we'll be voting on. A yes vote for Amendment 3 will support legalizing marijuana for adults 21 years and older and allowing individuals to possess up to three ounces of marijuana. A no vote would oppose that. So what we really need to consider is how a Christian should think about marijuana. This is a real issue now. This is an issue in our life now. What does the Bible say about marijuana? Well, the Bible doesn't specifically mention marijuana, but it does give us the opportunity to use some discernment, to apply biblical principles to a subject like the use and support of marijuana. Well, the Bible does, again, say several different things that we can apply here. And first of all, we we can see that just on a practical level, number one, marijuana use remains illegal at a federal level. Federally, it's illegal still. So no matter how many states pass it, if you use or possess it, federally, you're breaking the law. It's just the reality of it. Despite the changes in state laws, even medicinal use of marijuana is illegal under federal law. Uh, at the federal level, marijuana is classified as, as a Schedule One drug under the Controlled Substances Act, and it's determined to have a high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use, prohibiting its use for any purpose. That's the federal law on marijuana. So first of all, that puts us in a bind with Romans 13 being subject to the governing authorities. Because one of our governing authorities, the federal government, says it's illegal still, even medicinally. Number two, marijuana is addicting and mind-altering. And the Bible does speak clearly to this. Paul tells us that believers are not to be living in a manner that includes chronic intoxication or drunkenness. 1 Corinthians 6, if you'd like to turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, lists sins that should not be true of Christians. Paul gives a, a long list of the things that should not be found in the life of a Christian. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, it says this, Or do you not know that unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God? So these things are considered unrighteousness. So we as the people of God are to be righteous. These things are unrighteousness. It says, do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, or idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. So again, this is a list of things that are not true of Christians any longer. I say any longer because Paul says, and such were some of you. Not and such are some of you, but because he's writing to Christians, he knows the Holy Spirit has done its work, his work in their lives. Such were some of you, but you've been washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. And the implication is, therefore, you are no longer these things. So these things should not be found in the life of a Christian. And one of the things on the list there is being a drunkard. That can be, as we'll see in a moment, that can fall under the the subject of marijuana use. We need to be living as as though we are changed people. And this is not a legalistic uh, implication by Paul here. This is God's work in us. We're no longer these things. We've been changed. We have been made able to do God's good pleasure, as Philippians 2 tells us. Thirdly, we are commanded to walk in wisdom. If you want to turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Similarly, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul speaks of the realities of a Christian. 
And in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 15, he says this, Therefore, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. On account of this, don't be foolish. Which is kind of the other side of the same coin. If you're going to be wise, you're not going to be foolish. And he says, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to, for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. So again, while this passage doesn't mention marijuana specifically, it does deal with important problems that come with its use. Paul tells us that we should not live in foolish ways, but we should walk as wise believers. We should make the best use of our time and pursue the will of God. In verse 18, that is said to be not being drunk with wine, but be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Drunkenness is something that is forbidden throughout Scripture. Drunkenness, being under the influence, being controlled by alcohol. But again, drinking alcohol itself is not forbidden. Being intoxicated and controlled by alcohol is. And this is where it comes into context with the idea of marijuana. The difference between a drug like marijuana and something like alcohol. Because some people have used a comparison to alcohol with marijuana to justify its use. Because the Bible doesn't condemn the use of alcohol outright. It condemns drunkenness. And so people will use that argument to say, well, they can use a little bit of marijuana. But marijuana and alcohol are not the same thing. Someone can drink alcohol without becoming intoxicated. In fact, the Bible tells us that. Drunkenness is clearly prohibited. We just saw Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk with wine. Romans 13.13, 13, let, let us walk properly in the day, not carousing and in drunkenness. 1 Peter 4.3, the time is already past sufficient for you to have worked out the desires of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. So drunkenness is very clearly forbidden in Scripture. Because you're giving yourself over to the control of something else. That's drunkenness. That's why it's forbidden. Because you are no longer living, being controlled by the Spirit. You're giving that over to being controlled by alcohol. However, the reality is, the Bible isn't all negative when it speaks of alcohol. The Bible actually does speak positively of it in some places. In fact, Psalm 104 speaks of the purpose of all of God's creation. It goes through a list of different things we find in our world, and it speaks of its purpose, why God gave it. And in Psalm 104, 14, and 15, it says, He causes the grass to grow for the cattle, and vegetation for man's cultivation, to bring forth food from the earth, and wine to make man's heart glad, to make his face glisten with oil, and food which sustains man's heart. So God has given wine in order to make man's heart glad. That's what it says. So it's speaking of alcohol in a positive light. And there's other places you could look. Proverbs 31, 6 and 7, Ecclesiastes 9, 7. Alcohol is a complicated issue. It is. There are circumstances where it is sinful. We'll see, you can see in other places like Romans 14, that if you're causing your brother to stumble, then it's your sin if you drink in front of him. It's, that's a sinful uh, way to, to partake in alcohol. But the reality is the Bible doesn't condemn alcohol altogether. So people use that as an argument to support the use of marijuana. In fact, uh, just to finish that thought, the, the Bible actually forbids us from forbidding people to partake of alcohol. Colossians 2.16 says, No one's to judge you in food or drink. So we're not to be passing judgment on others in those areas. Paul says in, in Romans 14 that all things are clean. So the, the alcohol itself is not forbidden or unclean. It's how you do it or how you use it. Alcohol is not forbidden. Drunkenness is. And that is the main problem 
with marijuana. That is why marijuana is not comparable to alcohol. Because it is intended to control the user. And it is intended to intoxicate. When people speak of using marijuana, they talk about getting high. Because they use it for the intoxicating effect of it. I know a man by the name of Charles Hodges. And he was a medical doctor and he became a Christian counselor. Um, I, I went to four years of Christian counseling training when I was in seminary, and he was one of our trainers. He's a very smart man, and he brought a lot of good insight into the, the realm of Christian counseling from a medical perspective. He gives a lot of insight on how medical issues and biological issues affect counseling issues. And he worked a lot with people who used marijuana, so he had a lot of insight, and he's actually written extensively on the dangers of marijuana that a lot of people don't either don't realize or don't confess to. They'd rather look the other way when it comes to the reality of the dangers of marijuana. And one of the things he warns against is the, the addictive nature of it. Most people are uh, either confused or they deny the addictive nature of marijuana. In fact, he says that most people he works with tell him they can quit any time. But they don't. Because they can't. It's a very addictive substance. So that itself, Paul tells us, all things are lawful, but I will not be mastered by anything. We are not to be controlled by anything. So when marijuana is that addictive, that is another reason why we should not have any part in a, an addictive substance like that. Marijuana is much more addictive than people even realize. Another factor is the, the fact that marijuana distorts reality. And a lot of times its use is intended to numb people to reality. It, they, it numbs people to experience life as it truly is. People use it as a, an escape mechanism to, to dull the either uh, depression or anxiety or the, the stress of life. People use it to escape those things. So uh, uh, even a small amount puts the user into a fog where they're not fully aware of what's going on. And larger amounts lead to real big problems like paranoia and, and other serious mental issues. So really, uh, that's the, the third reason that Scripture prohibits marijuana is that it's addicting and mind-altering. It's, it's a substance that controls you. It, it falls under the category of drunkenness. You cannot use it without falling into that category. A fourth reason is one thing we already mentioned with alcohol, is it causes others to stumble. We need to think about how our behavior affects others. Paul deals with the argument between vegetarians and meat eaters in, in the middle of Romans 14. He even touches on what we drink in Romans 14. And he tells them that there's nothing wrong with partaking of these things, but he's not going to do it if it's going to make his brother stumble. He refuses to partake in these things if it will make his brother stumble, because he is that concerned about the soul of his fellow believer. He doesn't want them to fall into a sin that may be a temptation in their life. This is a good reason to abstain from alcohol, if that's your conviction. If you have those around you who are alcoholics in the past, or they know they have a problem with that, this is a great reason to not partake in alcohol. Same thing is true of marijuana. Smoking marijuana affects others. Marijuana can be a temptation and addiction for a lot of people. And putting that in front of them can cause them to stumble. So that's number four. Number five, it has negative mental effects. Regular marijuana use causes disengagement, uh, dulling individuals into a long-term, slow, and subtle numbness. These are definitions I've looked up in the study of these things. If you ask anyone who's been a former user of marijuana and who has stopped, they'll tell you about this, how it numbs them to the experiences around them. Usually a regular marijuana user will deny this because it's hard to be honest with the reality of the situation they're in. But recreational use of marijuana violates the, our value of sobriety, being sober-minded, being clear-thinking. 1 Thessalonians 5 6 through 8 says, Let us not sleep as others do, but let us be awake and be sober. 
That does not characterize the marijuana user. Being awake and being sober. goes on to say, For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith, love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. 1 Peter 4, 7 says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be sound thinking, sober spirit, for the purpose of prayer. We need to be clear thinking. We need to be clear thinking. And, and marijuana use does not contribute to clear thinking. So, with all of this biblical evidence, really the biblical principles that we can pull out and apply to a subject like marijuana, well, certainly the, the Christian should not be using marijuana. And when it comes to voting on legalizing marijuana, the Christian should vote no on Amendment 3. When it comes to legalizing marijuana in our community, we should use our vote to vote against this, to vote against legalizing marijuana and keep it illegal and out of the hands of those who could become addicted to it, could become entrapped by it. So that's Amendment 3. And we come to Amendment 4. Amendment 4 is a big one. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of publicity about it because it's, it's been in our face for a while now. I remember back even last summer, down at First Friday, there was people going around with petitions to get this on the ballot. And apparently they must have gotten enough signatures to get it on the ballot. Now, they were being very deceptive in the way they were doing it because they came up to me and said, do you support women? Do you support mothers? You should sign our petition. That's all they said. And then that petition goes to put this on the ballot. Amendment 4 would provide a constitutional right to abortion. This amendment has been called by some the most extreme abortion law in the world. Removes all restrictions. Even European countries have more restrictions on abortion than this law would allow. And yet there's a... Um, a little pamphlet out there on the foyer speaking specifically to Amendment 4, and it has a lot of good information, things they point out, that when it talks about, well, for reasons of health of the mother, well, they, it could, they could use that to mean anything. It could mean mental health of the mother. And, and so the way it's worded is, is very intentional. It removes all restrictions on something like abortion. So with the rest of our time this evening, let's consider what the Bible says about abortion. Abortion is a very grim reality, but it's very central in our life in America in 2024. There was a decision several years ago now to overturn Roe versus Wade, and a lot of people saw that as a great victory, which in some ways it was, but in other ways, it turns things over to the state, and now states can push an even more radical agenda. They can push an even more radical perspective on something like abortion. But what does God's word have to say about abortion? Well, again, the term abortion is not used in scripture, just like marijuana isn't. But that doesn't mean God's word doesn't have something to say about unborn babies in the womb. It has a lot to say. To begin with, God's word is clear that con the conception of a life is never an accident. It's never an accident. Our God is sovereign. God personally creates every life. Psalm 127, verse 3 says, Behold, children are an inheritance of Yahweh. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Every life in the womb is a gift from God. Every single one of them. They come from the hand of God himself. Over and over throughout Scripture, God shows His sovereign control over man's ability to have children. From Abraham and Sarah, to Rebecca, to Hannah, to Elizabeth, and on and on and on. God shows He has complete control over the womb. He opens and closes wombs. Paul says in Acts 17, 24, that God is the God who made the world and all things in it. Everything that comes into this world is from the hand of God. 
God is sovereign over life. And life begins at conception. And we can look at a lot of different verses that speak to God's care for those in the womb. One of the clearest evidences of life in the womb, and one of my favorites, is Luke 141. And Luke 141 is John the Baptist in his mother's womb. And in Luke 141, it says, It happened that when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, Elizabeth is John the Baptist's mother. John the Baptist at this point is in his mother's womb, in Elizabeth's womb. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Little John the Baptist in his mother's womb, who would be called a fetus or an embryo, or whatever term you want to use that they use today. He worshipped when Mary, who was pregnant with our Savior, walked through the door. That is consciousness. That is life. One life worshipping the greatest life who ever lived. David speaks of God's care for him in the womb. In Psalm 139, Verses 13 through 16. He says, You formed my inward parts. You wove me together in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes have seen my unshaped substance, and, you, and in your book, all of them were written, the days that were formed for me, as yet when there was none of them. Before David even lived a day, God was forming him. He was a life in his mother's womb, who God was caring for. And similarly, Job says in Job 10, verses 8 through 12, Your hands fashioned and made me all together. And, you would, and would you swallow me up? Remember now that you have made me as clay, and would you turn me into dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk, and curdle me like cheese, clothe me with skin and flesh, and knit me together with bones and sinews? You have made alongside me life and loving kindness, and your care has kept my spirit. That's Job describing the process of conception in poetic language. And he's describing that as God's working, God's doing, God's creating him. God is intimately involved with our formation in the womb. God cares about unborn babies. And one of the most atrocious realities about abortion is that it targets those with deformities and disabilities. The numbers of those with Down syndrome have dropped drastically in our world today. And it's not because of any medical advancements. It's not because anybody's found any sort of cure for it. It's because they're being annihilated in the womb. They're being wiped off the face of the earth because of something that's not in their control. Those who they claim are biological mistakes or accidents. Well, there is no such thing as a biological accident. Because God is sovereign over the womb. And God is sovereign over deformities and disabilities. In Exodus chapter 4, as Moses is stumbling over himself, coming up with reasons why he can't, speaking about his own speech troubles, his speech impediment, or whatever it may be, Yahweh speaks to Moses and says, Who has made man's mouth? Or who has made him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, Yahweh? Who makes man seeing or blind, mute or deaf? Down syndrome or not? God does. In John 
chapter 9, verse 3, speaking about the man born blind, as his disciples asked him, whose sin was it that led to this? Was it his or his parents? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this was so that the work of God may be manifested in him. God made him blind on purpose. There was no mistake. It was no accident. It was no deformity. God did that. Every creation is an act of God. And the creation account is very clear that every human creation bears God's image. Every one. No matter what deformity or disability or mistake or accident may be claimed. Every single one bears God's image. In Genesis 1.26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. So therefore, everything that comes after that first man, that can be classified a man, or humankind, or human being, inherently has the image of God. This sets humanity apart from the rest of creation. After God initiates conception, we're not just a product of biological sequence. We're not just a clump of cells. Our skin and our bones and our muscles, they are not what makes us human. Everything we need for thinking and acting and feeling and knowing and trusting and hoping, everything fundamental to being a person, comes from God. And it's present in the womb. The result of being image bearers is that each and every human life has inherent value. Everyone who bears the image of God carries the weight of bearing the image of God. That's why God's word condemns murder and prescribes the strictest punishment possible for those who would carry out murder. And this precludes the Mosaic law. This didn't come about when Israel became a nation. We talked about this in Sunday school this morning over in the other Sunday school room, the adult Sunday school class over across the way there. We talked about Genesis 9 as the background for Romans 13, because Genesis 9 is the very first institution of a human government, and that is that humans are to carry out consequence upon other humans. This was not enacted at creation, it's enacted as a result of the fall. And after Noah and his family come off the ark... God wants to make it clear to them that sin didn't go away yet. That just because I wiped out all the other wicked people and you came through the flood, you're going to have some consequences to deal with because of sin still. And he says in Genesis 9, 6, as a new mandate for humans, as the the institution of the very first forms of a God-given government... Genesis 9, 6 says, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Man is to carry out capital punishment upon murderers. And this is well before the time of Abraham and Moses and the nation of Israel. This is not Mosaic law. This is God's law. This is Inherent because of bearing the image of God. And throughout the scriptures, we see God making special provision for the poor and the weak and the helpless. Over and over, his people are called to look after those who cannot look after themselves. Psalm 82 is is an example. Psalm 82, 3 and 4 says, Give justice to the poor and the orphan. Justify the afflicted and the destitute. Protect the poor and the needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. 
Is there any more, anyone else more weak and helpless and defenseless than an unborn child? This command of God should be at the forefront of our minds when over a million unborn children are killed every year in our nation. And these are all generalities speaking about life and image bearing and the punishment for murder and taking care of the needy. We can apply all that that to the theme of the unborn and abortion. But does God's word have anything specific to say to taking the life of someone in the womb? You bet it does. In Exodus 21. Exodus 21, verses 22 to 25. Turn there with me. This is a passage of Scripture that you should know when speaking with friends and family about something like abortion. Exodus 21. Because what often happens is we think, well, that was then. The Bible spoke to things that were centuries ago. We live in a different world. God doesn't have anything to say about the world that we live in. Exodus 21, verses 22 through 25. This is God's law speaking to the nation of Israel and how they should deal with different situations that come up. And this is the situation. If men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, prematurely, yet there is no injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband will set for him, and he shall pay as the judges decide. So this situation is an accident. If two men are fighting and they accidentally strike a woman who's pregnant and the woman gives birth, if there's no harm done to the baby, there's still a fine that needs to be paid. But, it continues, verse 23, but if there is any further injury, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, Burn for burn, bruise for bruise, wound for wound. There's only one other type of sin that this is applied to, this very wording. It's the taking of human life. It's murder. The Bible speaks of causing an abortion in the terms of murder. If you cause a woman to give birth prematurely and the child dies, you shall pay life for life. Genesis 9, 6. You shall pay life for life. According to God, killing an infant is murder. It's taking a life. It's taking an innocent life. And murder is a capital crime. It deserves the death penalty. So scripture doesn't have to use the word abortion to make the point any more clear. So to answer the question on how a Christian should vote on Amendment 4, if it hasn't been made already clear, a Christian must vote no on Amendment 4. A Christian can have no part in legalizing the murder of the unborn because God hates it. If we want to promote righteousness in our land, we need to vote no on Amendments 3 and 4. And the reality is that in all of this, we've talked about some heavy things tonight, but in all of this, there is good news. God's redeeming grace is available and it's able to overturn even a sin like abortion. The Lord can use even the most heinous acts of sin to display His grace. 
Take, for example, the most heinous sin of all, Jesus' crucifixion. Judas and Pilate and the Romans and the Jews, who all conspired together, they were all guilty of murder against the only truly innocent person in the world. Jesus was more innocent than any life that's been taken in the womb. But even still, God worked through those sins to accomplish his will and to dis display his grace. And the same is true with abortion. It is a horrific tragedy. But God's redeeming grace is still available. It's available to all the participants. There is forgiveness in Christ. There's forgiveness for mothers who've had an abortion in the past. And even though they may face daily reminders of their sin, they can be washed free of its guilt and spared of its punishment through the atoning work of Christ. Christ paid for those sins too. And even the abortion doctors who are responsible for taking these precious lives, they can be rescued from the punishment of their sins and forgiven through repentance and faith. And God is exceedingly gracious. His forgiveness is able to extend to everyone who's ever been involved in an abortion through repentance and faith. From the abortion clinic nurses and the counselors and those who aid in infant murder on a daily basis, to those who active, actively lobby for pro-choice laws and politicians who fight to keep it legal, to the journalists and the reporters and the entertainers who promote abortion every day, to the husbands and boyfriends who don't protect their children as horrible and unthinkable as abortion is. God's mercy is more. God's mercy is willing to forgive the repentant sinner. And that is the joyous confession of all of us. God's grace is greater than our sin. God's grace is greater than any sin. And remember what I told you earlier. We should speak to the evil of our day. We should speak out against those who are being taken advantage of, those who are being killed, the helpless, the needy. But you should never turn your mission field into your enemy. There's forgiveness for everyone who repents and comes to Christ. So if you do not yet know Christ, you need to come to know him today. You can be forgiven of any sin that you've committed because God's mercy is more than your sin. And Christ is on his throne. And he always will be. And what happens on Tuesday is important, and we have an important responsibility in it. But no matter what, Christ is on his throne. Come to him and follow the King of Kings. Let's stand, if you're able, and close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity that it brings to difficult situations. We thank you for the instruction that you give us so that when it comes to things that are hard to stomach, hard to understand, that we can find the truth in your word. Lord, we pray for our country. 
We pray for our state. We pray for our local community. We know that your will is righteousness. We pray that that will would be done. That you would bring about righteousness through our obedience. But no matter what happens in our election this week, I pray that we would trust in you. That we would remember that you are sovereignly in control of all things. And that if if it is your will for our country to undergo more of your judgment, then your will be done as well. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you're a God who hears us. We thank you that you're a God who cares for us. We thank you for giving us your image. We pray for this horrendous sin that is taking place in our nation every day. We pray for those involved in it, that you would bring them to repentance, that they would realize what they're doing. They would turn from the wickedness that's in their heart and that they would come to you for salvation and that you would give them a new heart and they would, again, turn away from those things and that we would see change in our nation. And we know that's the only way we will see change is through changed hearts. And we can trust you to bring that about. But in all things, Lord, we trust in your sovereignty that no matter what happens, you are in control. And we thank you for these things. And we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen.